I'd like to introduce to you first Con Squires. Con is an author and a poet from Nahant, Massachusetts. He's been writing ever since he can remember. And Con noted that he was inspired by Stephen Spender's poem in high school, where he said he had a sense that you could do really anything with poetry. And uh, Con noted that he was hooked for life after that poem. And since then, he has been writing for life. He has written a chapbook of poetry with Pudding House Press. And he has written a trade book, Teach Yourself to Write Irresistible Fundraising, fundraising Letters, and a historical novel about the first emperor of newly united China in 221 BC with Cavendish Press. And more recently, he's written a full-length book of poems, Ifka's Castle, published by Every Other Tuesday Press. In the poems within that book, Khan uh, noted travel from youth to age, aloneness to fellowship, China to Canada to California, and also of importance to Khan, a number of the poems travel with some humor. And lastly, speaking of humor, uh, which Khan does like to include in his writing, um, when I asked about one of it, his most memorable moments of sharing writing, Khan noted that there was a time where he was known as the refrigerator poet of Cape Cod. <laughs> because he would find out that a number of people from different places on the Cape would have his poems on their refrigerators, which is quite an honor. So with that, I would like to introduce to you Con Squires. Please welcome him up here. I'd like to uh, read nine short poems and tell you a little bit about where each of them came from. Um, most of the poems I will read are in Ifka's Castle. Um, I chose for the book what I felt were the strongest poems that I had written. It's pretty much the story of my, my life. Um, the first poem happened because we went to a wedding out in the Finger Lakes a few weeks ago. Uh, <coughs> when I was writing it, I followed Richard Hugo's uh, strategy in uh, a wonderful book, uh, 13 Letters and 31 Dreams, in which he, he began each poem, Dear So-and-So, um, <coughs> and I, I adopted the same strategy here. So this first one is called Celebrating the Marriage of Emily, Daughter of Matt and Peggy, to Tristan, September 2014. Nice long title. Dear Matt and Peggy, Bonnie has written a fine poem about the wedding for you. I'm glad because although I'm also grateful and proud to be included, the truth is I don't feel very poetic today. I've been practicing piano relentlessly. I got out my first piano book, the one I went through on my own before taking lessons. I started on page one and played every piece the book offered. My fingers are numb, but I'm back in the swing, though not as swinging as you two, you legends of the hills. Night before last and the night before that, how do you do it? Emily is a child of grace, by whom I mean you, Peggy. And Tristan is a taller Matt, a good guy, a man taught to dance by goats. I forecast showers of happiness, dippers full of laughter. The lake shines bright, the hills rise to the sun, sleepy, smelling of apples. The county is full of joy. I'm going to put on my glasses if you don't mind. I'm having a little trouble seeing here. Oh, that's so much better. <laughs> um, I can see my notes in addition to the poems. This next one is just for fun and for nostalgia, a lot of nostalgia. It's called Like Love. Oh, I was the tall brown boy once a laughing light tree and a green wind of birds. And you were the girl with wet stockings just coming back from the spring. For such a meeting, we hadn't dared hope, unwilling to spill the least droplet, sliding up sunlight strewn by the stars, your almond eyes, islands of joy. 
All of the forest was wandering with us. Grasses rose to our whispering, our unshod feet. Maybe your hand finds mine as we sit, nothing else, half so sweet. Oh, I was the tall brown boy once, a laughing light tree in a green wind of birds. And you were the girl with wet stockings, just coming back from the spring. This next is when my dad was a lot younger, perhaps in his 50s. In his college days, he led a jazz band, which was called Andy Squires and his Hot Potatoes. <laughs> so you can perhaps see where this poem is coming from. My dad imagines he is a Japanese nobleman, <coughs> Pish Tush, in the Wilton, Connecticut Play Shop's 1953 production of The Mikado. The costume and makeup men are even less talented than he. <laughs> but there is persistent hope in the occidental eyes. No excess of eyeliner can disguise. My father imagines his triumph in this small role, a trio, a quartet, a spoken line or two. And he will have it, because he can brush away a collapsing entry arch, the hash he makes each time he sings, a cheap and chippy chopper on a big black block and laughter at odd moments. Nothing dims his spotlight when he is on stage. When he has a line, he is hugely animated. When he doesn't, he is comatose. <laughs> In Wilton, they love him and cheer his relentless enthusiasm. Though I wouldn't have said so then, it does a son good to see that. Honesty compels me to admit, admit that I was a spear carrier in that same production, and I was the one who pulled down the entry arch, <laughs> nearly decapitating the Mikado. <laughs> this one was quite a while uh, later when my dad was in his mid-70s. <clears throat> my mother had died of a massive heart attack. It was, of course, a huge shock for him. And I wrote this poem the following winter, Calling My Father. Calling my father isn't so easy these days. He is furred to his walls like a snail asleep in the spirals. He lets the telephone ring more times than he used to, and his faint voice asks questions concerned with the locking of doors. He casts bread to bare spaces on the icy lawn but looks away before the birds come down. Think of birds in the changing colors of the sun, frightened by the tramp of our determined feet, gathering at dawn and sunset along the power lines, their outer fingers thrilling in the wind. A buoy bell rings, a fishing boat motors invisibly down the channel that splits the salt marsh. Here in the deep cupped palms of winter, his bones are hollowing for flight. And then inevitably, I suppose dad passed away as well, <clears throat> also of a heart failure. Um, we uh, had create, cremated mother and scattered her ashes in the uh, Cape Cod Bay. <clears throat> and eight years after that, we did the same thing for my dad, we being my brother and sister and I. And this is called Estuary. It's where dad said goodbye to mother. Cold rain, gray dawn. As he emptied the vase of ash and bone, he stumbled and nearly fell into the swift flowing water. We moved closer around him and held him where he stood, weeping and shivering, frail, older than we had thought. Years later, we carried him to the place he last touched her and gave him also to the estuary, that daily argument of land and sea. At low tide, a child could jump over it, just a small tear in the beach a crooked finger of the bay that says, come in, come in. And now for something a good deal lighter. <clears throat> um, 
for a good many years, I worked as a fundraising copywriter. <clears throat> I wrote for an amazing number of hospitals, over 100 at last count, and virtually every one at one point or another pulled out <clears throat> a drawer that was just full of letters of a particular kind. <clears throat> and uh, over time, I noticed that they had a lot of common features. And um, this was my attempt to write one that sounded most of the themes I was reading. Um, oh, uh, yes, it seemed pretty boring when I was da done. So just for fun, I deleted the last word of every line. <laughs> if you will, please help me to uh, rebuild it by suggesting the missing word. I will pause for your thought. <laughs> this is to our hospital. I write to express the heartfelt Thanks. of my family. Family, right. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> to the entire Staff. community. Staff. Hospital. Hospital, yes. Um, for their kindness, warmth, care, Bill. <laughs> efforts. <laughs> <clears throat> on behalf of my beloved spouse, <laughs> late brother James, that's it. <laughs> so many kind things were done. done, right? For him, from everyone, strangers, ew, <laughs> doctors, <laughs> nurses, nurses. <laughs> When, from when, they wheeled him in. in. After the ambulance had a flat. <laughs> on, on, right. Route, which between you and me didn't help his ruptured <laughs> spleen, yes. Every courtesy was yes to James, our beloved brother. They opened him up, up. <laughs> very strong in the front here <laughs> in less than three seconds. Hours, hours. <laughs> uh, do door to table. Door to table. Here. Here. Top. I know the doctors did everything. Right. Humanly possible to save. Okay. Good. But it was too late. late. The nurses were stupendous. Stupendous is wonderful. The food was. I was thinking of excellent, but you know, <laughs> the, ba the, f the bathroom was clean and shiny. Shiny is good. <clears throat> the family knows you did all you could for him. F for our beloved brother. I know God loves you. As I do. All. <laughs> Somewhere. Somewhere else? <laughs> Jim does two. two, right. We enclose a small yeah. check. Thank you. <laughs> and um, this is something that I saw happening in Star Market. Uh, which is now Shaw's, one night. I thought, write this down, and did so. <clears throat> it's called Man Dancing in Star Market. <laughs> really. He jumps left, skips right, windmills his arms, deep dips, whirls, lovingly partners his eager cart. His shoulders make figure eights as his Fezziwig feet twinkle on invisible Arthur Murray footprints. It's like seeing a whooping crane in a shooting gallery. 
He dances past the photo counter, passes me in aisle four, aisle seven, burst into and out of the cold room, just one small box in his cart. He is tall and thin, with gray hair erupting above wire-framed glasses. He dances with pointed beard. I watch his sideburns, knees, and fingers. Below baggy tan shorts, his bony white shins are covered with scratches. <clears throat> Everyone looks away, gives him lots of room. We are only here for our food. I want to take my shiny cart for a waltz too. Dance, 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 until the last counter closes. Yes, ma'am. OK. <clears throat> On the Isle of Capri one time, I read a great book of poems from World War I, depressingly called Up the Line to Death. <laughs> About 40% of the poets, the English poets, died in the war as young men, which I think is about equivalent to the general population mortality. <clears throat> I cannot imagine what they would have written had they survived, but to me they were already great. This is for them all. To the English poets of World War I, I spent hours reading in your company, one quiet afternoon, quite free, no green gas or whiz-bangs falling, just snow blowing in its random way. It's been a hundred years since you died. You put your notebook down, rose, rifle in hand, and climbed through all the mud up to the wire and the bone dry sand. Running the last few yards, you stopped to free a jammed rifle. There was the rap of a machine gun and down you went with no breath left to scream. Your comrades dead as well. There is no way to tell how good you were, how much better you might have been. No muffled drum to sing you thence, no bugle by the tripwire fence. And finally, a short one. <clears throat> um, just before I wrote this, I had just met my beloved brother-in-law and dear sister-in-law, and they had just had their twins, their firstborn. It came uh, time to feed them both, the, the babies, that is. Kirk was holding Kyle like this, and Julie was holding Drew like this, and I thought, that looks like something. So later I wrote this poem. It's very short. So were the babies. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called First Chairs for Kirk and Julie Bishop. I thought, they seem like violins. Guarneri, perhaps warm to the touch, full-toned, impossible not to play. They must, like violins, be held just so, one certain way. When stroked by the fiddler's bows, they curl, uncurl their toes, and sing with a milky sound. Thank you. My poem is called Late Bloomer. My mother said I always was one. And so I feel a kinship with foxhole conversions and ninth inning home run hitters. In this maligned month of November, especially, I love the convoluted cabbage rows, bedraggled daisies in their second flowering, the puffs of lavender asters straggling along the fence. I take heart from rumors of witch hazel breaking into clouds of tiny yellow blooms in dark woods where I have never walked. And friendships begun when days are shrinking like an iris in a twilit sky. And those who, like her, conscious that death is close as night, grow graceful tendrils, bud and blossom, amazing the vigilant beside the bed. Thank you. In the smallest breeze, leaf 
by leaf, the maple lets go, turns its corner of the yard into an image of itself. That same gold on the lawn, in the laps of the spruce, that counting, counting. As if they had agreed together, the leaves have staggered themselves. So we've gone from green and gold to gold and scarlet. Now gold and scarlet and blue as the body of the tree has thinned as the sky shines through. If you are not from Africa, you might think hippopotami are like giant cows in the river. You envision them placidly paddling to each grassy bank as they daintily feast. But people from Africa fear, fear hippos greatly, and as my sad tale I deliver, Keep in mind that thousands of people are killed every year by this full-figured beast. In 1981, the richest drug lord in all the world was Pablo Escobar. And on his hacienda in Colombia, he built a zoo with animals from afar. With zebras, elephants, giraffes, and bison, the coolest critters cocaine cash could buy. But on one fateful day, real danger came to stay when Pablo bought for hippopotami. Look out, look out, they may be herbivorous, but those tusks would just as soon gore us for their nasty nature. They're notorious. Two-ton pit bulls they are. Beware the horrible hippos of Pablo Escobar. <laughs> and by the way, that's the refrain. You can sing it next time it comes along. In 1993, the Fed shot Pablo. They seized his ranch and his menagerie. Dispatched them all to zoos across the country. But some were just too big and ornery. The hippos were left to their own devices, assuming they'd eventually die. But 20 years have passed, and not only did they last, those hippos have escaped and multiplied. Look out, look out, there now are over 50 in the wild. And lest you think that's nifty, Exponential growth no longer iffy now that the door's ajar. Beware the horrible hippos of Pablo Escobar. Thank you. The hippos now are thriving in the tropics. No predators, no drought, no lack of grass. They're roaming far and wide and having babies. Invasive species with a massive smile. <laughs> the fishermen are terrified of boating. The farmers say their crops are being et. You won't think hippos cute when they are in pursuit. They're more an infestation than a pet. Look out, look out, you can't just relocate them. You could catch meningitis if you ate them. They complain if you try to castrate them. They'd make you steak tartar. Look out, look out, in South American markets, fishermen, before you dare embark, it's time to pray. Just like Jurassic Park, it's already gone too far. Beware the horrible hippos of Pablo Escobar. Beware the horrible hippos of Pablo Escobar. Thank you very much. 
I do not like Budweiser beer. I do not like it there or here. Not in a bar, not in a car. I do not like Budweiser beer. I won't drink it in a jug. I won't drink it in a mug. Not with a dame, not watching a game. I do not like Budweiser beer. I won't drink it like comedy fans. I won't drink it with any man. Not with a czar, not with a star. I do not like Budweiser beer. I don't like it with those beer nuts. This stuff sickens deep in my guts. Not with cheese, not after raking leaves. I just don't like Budweiser's beer. I don't even like Bud Light. I can't drink that day or night. Not with bards, like you. Not with playing cards. I don't like Budweiser beer. But then again, haha, I do like Jack's Abbey, even though it makes me flabby. <laughs> I do like it in a pu at their pub. I even like it in the tub. And I like it in a bar, in a car, in a jug, in a mug, with a dame watching a game, with a star, even with a czar if I knew one. I like it with cheese after raking leaves. I, uh, I'd even like it with you bards and even playing cards. So Abby comes with lots of flavor, but too many makes me waver. Once I slugged their framing hammer, and that jug put me in the slammer. So dump the bud and chug Jack Suds. Those Abbey beers sure beat the buds. <laughs> Thank you. Uh,